So this sounds kind of weird, but I love failure. Mm -hmm. Failure for some reason wakes me up so much. It, it's just, what did, you know, what did I do wrong? What did, what I, all that woulda, coulda, I jump on that right after I fail. Cause yeah, you can do that from a year from now. Oh, I wish I would have ran 240. I wish I would have, you know, like, like for, for you, for instance, if you hadn't gone to one of those um, boot camps you were talking about, the Navy SEAL thing, or imagine if you hadn't finished one, you know, you'd have been drooling, you know, to get on another one. I can tell by your attitude, you would have jumped back on it. This is the Tom Rowland Podcast. Fascinating stories to amaze, encourage, and inspire you in fishing, fitness, and the outdoors. And we're brought to you by Black Rifle Coffee. I started this podcast as a way to connect with my friends, people that I admire and respect, and you. It has been a learning journey that's made me a better person, a better fisherman, a better father, and a better athlete. I'm so happy that you're on this journey with me, and I'd love to hear from you with show suggestions, guest suggestions, or questions. The best way to get a hold of me is through text. You can text 305-930-7346 for the fastest response, but if you prefer to email, you can send that to podcast at saltwaterexperience.com. That's a dedicated email address just for the show. If you like this show, you can show your support by posting about it on social media and tagging me. Text the link to a couple of friends that may also enjoy it and subscribe and leave a five-star review if you feel like I've earned it. The website is TomRollandPodcast.com, and that is where everything lives. All past shows, you can go and listen to any show. You can look up all the different shows that we've done, both the How To Tuesdays, the Full Links, and the Physical Fridays. They all live on TomRollandPodcast.com, and the social media is Tom underscore Roland, R-O-W-L-A-N-D, on Instagram, or you can go to our big account, saltwater underscore experience. I hope to hear from you soon. So now let's get on to today's show. I'm Jason Coffin, and this is the Tom Roland Podcast. Hey, Jason, what's up, man? How are you? I'm good. How about yourself? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. I've been looking forward to, uh, to connecting with you, and I'm going to start off by reading this post from a couple of days ago or recently anyway. All right. And this will, this will set the tone of why I wanted to talk to you and why I think we're going to have a really pretty awesome podcast here. In the last okay. 20 years, I've managed some pretty cool things. I have an inshore and offshore world records in fishing unofficial. I've been all over the world chasing the biggest sea monsters imaginable, imaginable, lived in an aluminum boat shed for four years at 120 degrees in the day because I had no money for a home. Once I floated for three days off Costa Rica until me and my first mate woke up and decided this was bullshit and we can fix anything and got our asses home. I've been in a bar in Central America when drug lords and had a meeting that turned into a shootout and I was almost hit with stray bullets. When my truck broke down in Costa Rica, I wasn't allowed to use the bait cooler at the marina or my bait would just be stolen. So I walked with a 50 to 55 pound cooler two miles down the beach, every charter, with it on my shoulder and walked home with my canine and my knife in hand so I wasn't robbed in the dark on the way home. I was stranded by a boat on a sandbar once 20 miles up a river in Panama when a storm changed the opening to the sea. Fast forward, I now have driven 7,000 miles per year to Oregon from Florida just to pursue my dream as a bow hunter and I have been unsuccessful but still going. I ran the Moab 240 race across Moab, Utah for 240 miles in four days because I felt it would make life easier. It worked, by the way. I am now in the best shape of my life, and I need to start taking business as serious as my endeavors. I never chase the dollar, always a dream with a story at the end. I am now chasing the dollar as I own and operate Coffin Jewelers and Mr. Trigger Sport Fishing to help me with a new endeavor to help stop poachers in a far off place in South Africa with my canine. This is going, this is the beginning of that journey. And I'm finally going to tell that story. Wow. Holy cow. Yeah. <laughs> you got a lot of stuff going on and you've done a lot of crazy things, man. How did all that I happen? I, I say I'm an entrepreneur that doesn't make any money. 
<laughs> well, there are a lot of those out there. Yeah, um, there is. So what about that crazy ride? How did that get started? Uh, the Costa Rica? All of it, man. Like where, um, fill me in. Uh, the where... Costa Rica thing was a probably, I was trying to write my dates down last night. Um, in 2000, I want to say 2004, a buddy of mine that owned a restaurant here moved his family to Costa Rica and they moved to Flamingo, Costa Rica, which is about three hours south of Nicaraguan border. Um, they had me come down in 2005 because they started a little charter business. They had like a 20 foot, uh, 27 foot. Um, uh, I don't remember the boat. It was an, in, it was an inboard, uh, gasoline engine. Mm -hmm. Um, so they called me up and, you know, people that don't fish think a fisherman is just a fisherman. Oh, they can do everything. Right. So I woke up one day and I, they sent me an email about everything they wanted me to do and all that. And I had never been out of the country. So I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> then they're like, oh yeah, you have, you have a billfish charter like a week after you got here. And I was like, oh, I've seen one sailfish in the Gulf. So let's, let's go ahead and do this. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that, that first time I went down was a disaster. I did it for a year. It was more like uh, I wasn't moving down there. It was more to help them kind of get it ready, you know, get the boat ready, get the tackle. Uh, they didn't even have, they didn't know what to buy. You know, so if they would have walked into a store, it would have been a nightmare right. you know, for them. Yeah. So we got them the right tackle. I did a lot of back and forth where I came back to the States and brought them supplies uh, with what kind of boat they had. Um, they didn't have a tower or outriggers or anything. So we really turned it into an inshore business. Huh. And um, that's when I got the unofficial world record rooster fish. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's unofficial because we didn't bring it in. We didn't have a scale. But it, it crushed the record. It was um, it was six foot four, six foot five. It was 157 what? pounds. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, we had a, you know, the copper scales that mm -hmm. go up to 200. Yeah. We had one of those. So it wasn't official, but, um, and it was actually with a guy here in Sarasota named Ron Gauthier. He, um, I don't know if he has the TV show anymore, but it was called Ocean Explorer. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I remember yeah. that. Yeah, it was it was actually him that caught it. So that oh, was very, very cool. cool to have a record of it. And I've got pictures and stuff. Yeah. Wow. So How was, do you catch a fish amazing. like that? Like where uh, a giant rooster fish like that? Is that um, inshore or offshore? Or where? Inshore. Yeah. Really? It's inshore is funny there. Like it's it's like California or something. I mean, the, the water just goes off. So we don't have like bays and stuff on the Pacific side. Mm -hmm. So you think about it as like California with the with the little beaches. And just mountain cliffs on the side. So, you know, uh, 50 yards offshore could be 100 feet deep. Wow. You know? So it is it is considered like when I priced out charters, that was an inshore charter. Yeah. Yeah. There's fishing rocks. Um, I'm doing a lot of slow trolling like you would. Think about fishing for kingfish with live bait around structure. Yeah. That's yeah. what you're doing. You, you know, like bumping, bumping drift, bumping drift, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Yeah. That's wow. how you get them. That's cool. Uh, yeah. My family's talking about... Uh, for some reason, my wife has it in her head that she wants to go to Costa Rica with, with the whole family. And I know there's some really awesome stuff down there, man. I'd love to talk oh, to you it's about a blast and definitely send me an email or a text before you guys do. And I'll send you a ton of ideas. Oh yeah. yeah. I would love that. I was that. down there for 11 years. So. You are 11 years. Yeah, yeah. Wow. You're like an expatriate down there. Yeah. Like, yeah. Basically. That's, I mean, you're yeah. really like turning into, into a local 11 years is enough to, to like really get, Oh you know, yeah. Entrenched yeah. into I mean, the whole yeah, culture. I had, I had a car registered down there. I had a Panamanian captain's license from Panama because Costa Rica honors it. I had a driver's license down there. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was there. That's awesome. But what happened was I went down there in 2005 with them and then I got that set up. I was there. I want to say I was there about, it was just under a year. So call it 10 months. So I was there about that time and they had their restaurant going and then it was kind of time, you know, I wasn't prepared to move down there. Um, so my father had just passed in 2003. So it was kind of like a get out of town kind of thing. It was kind of perfect timing for that kind of situation. But then I knew I needed to come back and, um, and help mom with the business in the beginning and all that. And I, had, I had just gotten started. Uh, remember the IFA the yeah. fish tournament? Oh yeah. Yeah. I had signed up for a few of those. I really wanted to pursue that. And I had signed up the year before. So it was kind of timing that I'd been on the water down there and then I was going to jump back and work at the store and uh, fish a couple of those. And I think that's when I met you guys. Yeah. Yeah. We were doing I that. I was going to ask you what year that was. Yeah. Um, so that was, been, so I was there almost, so it would have been 2006. 
Yeah. Yeah, 2006. I'm looking at, I've got an IFA trophy over there for something. And that's about, that's when it is. 2000, I think 2006 or 2005 or something, th- those yeah, years. It was, it was either it was either that transition of 2005 into six or it was all six. Because it was yeah. when I came back. And I came back around, um, so it would have been about October. So they got started in the spring usually, if mm-hmm. I remember right. Yeah. So that was about then. Yeah, so, cool. That's awesome, yeah. man. And and yeah. so then you spend 11 years in Costa Rica. And uh, so what happens? Came, how do you want to come home? That? How do you, how does it bring you back home? Um, so I went, I came home, I started to work there and I realized I was a jewelry repair for the shop. And I just realized sitting at a desk doing things right here, except for tying knots or flies was not me, mm-hmm. you know? So um, I got out of there. She had a great staff. Um, she liked all the people that she had. I trusted them. So about uh, seven months later, I got in a nasty car wreck mm. and I broke my left hip and I had back surgery. Really? Yeah. Um, I actually had the, what's crazy is I had the back surgery from a herniated disc that um, fused to my sciatic nerve. Oh so it man. And in so far that it got to my nerve and they grew together. Holy cow. Yeah. So they didn't know that until, you know, the MRI just shows a bulging disc. They didn't know until I went under the knife that they, I had to be under another 45 minutes to cut it off. Wow. Yeah. So what so, kind of pain um, was that, that you were going through when? In, insane. Yeah. Insane. I can't imagine. See, part, I just went through something kind of like that. I fell off the pull-up bar. I had a really bad fall off the pull-up bar. And somehow, I mean, I had this giant hematoma that came off my hip and, uh, and Everything was kind of okay, but I could feel something pushing against my sciatic nerve. And then just recently I went to a chiropractor and it made it a little bit better at first. And then, dude, so I don't know what it was, but something was pushing on that sciatic nerve. Yeah. And, and it was like a hot searing pain. And yeah, it's, I it's mean, insane. it's hard to describe. I'd never had it before. So the fact that that was, you had it to the degree that you did, man, that is... Yeah. Serious the pain. The only thing that would relieve pain was, you know, like uh, gymnasts have those parallel bars. Yeah. I could get on the parallel bars and let my feet hang. Yeah. What would take the weight off the spinal column. Uh-huh. That's the only thing that would relieve me. So I would literally crawl into the kitchen and put my arms up between two countertops just to relieve some pain. And That's nothing, nothing could change other than surgery at that point. Yeah, I, I I did a lot of physical therapy. My my surgeon is actually a friend of mine, and so he did not want to give me surgery. He was doing everything. Obviously, surgery, you know, is the last thing you want to mm-hmm. do. Mm-hmm. He was sending me all the top guys, and I would walk out of there in more pain. And they're mm-hmm. like, you know, why? <laughs> and it was because they were fused together. So when you're pulling that, like you've got your nerve. And you're pulling that disc back. It was pulling the nerve with it. Mm. So I was pulling the sciatic back into the spinal column. Wow. So I would, I would come out of physical therapy. Like I'm never walking in there again. You know, yeah. it was worse than I would have to go home and ice. And, you know, and unfortunately I got real bad on the Oxycontins too. Well, you know, I can like imagine that, why. I mean, listen, man, yeah. I just had this, it, th- just got over it. And the funny thing is I went from being almost in the worst condition ever to now when it all let go and it's no longer pushing on the nerve, everything let go that my upper back, my shoulders, even now my squat is deeper than it has been in a long time. So it went from being almost the worst to almost the best. Yeah. Just because that is. man, I'm telling you, man, I can, I can see, I just have just enough experience with that to know that that is just a, an awful yeah. pain and an awful situation. I could believe that you could get hooked on uh, Oxycontin. So what was that like getting hooked on? Um, that was, that was awful. That I'll, was awful. So I, mean, I watched in the, the beginning. It's, it's I'll, great. You know, you're, you're, yeah. on, you're feeling good, but did you see the, um, have you seen that dope sick um, on, on Hulu? It's called no. dope sick. It's got Michael Keaton in it and he plays this doctor. Um, it's incredible. It's an incredible uh, show. And, uh, I don't know. I liked it. Maybe you wouldn't want to revisit that. What was it called but again? No, I could. Dope, I'd be dope fine sick. With it. Yeah. Dope okay. sick, and it's about the very beginnings of the OxyContin um, epidemic, and how it started basically in the coal mines and and areas where people were serious hard workers. They would get injured on the job, 
They'd give them this, and almost yep. immediately, um, uh, there was a physical addiction to it. It got worse and worse and worse, and and the reaction from the from the drug company, um, at least as it was portrayed in this show, was crazy. They yep. kept making the pills stronger and stronger and stronger, yep. and there was even they were even saying, "Oh, when you feel these these uh, uh, addiction like characteristics, it's not that." What you need is more Oxycontin. That's and <laughs> and see, I just... went from my, my doctor was, you know, he was, a, he was a straight up guy. He gave me, you know, a little bit, you know, my prescription, but then laying around for seven months trying to get this better, you know, I went out and found my own, you know, yeah. and it, it, it does. You, you feel like, you know, you go from the most pain, like I was saying, I had to hold up my body, you know, to relieve the pain to, being able to just watch TV and take one of these and kind of, oh, it's gone. Well, about a week of that, you're like, uh oh, my pill didn't work. Mm-hmm. Let me take one and a half. You know, mm-hmm. let me crack another one and a half and take that. A week later, oh, well, let me just pop two. There's there's more in the jar, you know. And but I mean, it messes up your digestive system. Um, you you're you're not wanting to eat anymore. I mean, it's it's the whole nine yards. It's wow. it's awful. And I did that for about five months and then just cold turkey one day. And that's what I was going to get into about the Costa Rica. I just woke up one day and I go, no, nope, I'm done. So that was while you were in Costa Rica? This is no, going no. On? Oh. So I came home in 2005. I fished a couple of those redfish tournaments yeah. like we were talking about. Yeah. And then I hurt my back. I actually hurt my back in the, um, what was it called? The PTTS, the, um, oh, the yeah. tarpon tournament yeah, down yeah. in Booker Graham. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I herniated a disc trying to release a tarpon down there. And I went back to lifting and, and having fun. And that was not what I should have done. And that's when I think, you know, the disc fused to the sciatic nerve over time. And they didn't know that until I went under the knife. And then the car wreck was a week after my back surgery. A buddy went to take me out. Yeah. Um, he went to take me out to dinner to kind of celebrate that I was, that the oxys were gone. You know, I'm going to get back on track, probably go back down to coast. And I'm going to get into that in a second. And he was in his new sports car and he hit wet grass going around a corner. Oh. We went through a house. Wow. At about 60 miles an hour. We slid through grass kind of sideways through a fence, through a house. And I broke my left hip and dislocated my left shoulder. Wow. And the only reason I'm here today is because I didn't have a seatbelt on. Now, I'm not saying don't wear a seatbelt, obviously. But um, a board from the fence went through my seat and I got thrown out of the car and it went right through the seat to the back seat. That's how hard we hit a fence. Wow. Yeah. And it took um, I remember them telling me at the emergency room that it took nine guys to lift my trying to show it on camera, lift my hip and put it back in place. That's how bad it was. My my skin and ligaments were holding my leg on. Wow. Yeah. So, and that was right after. So, I mean, imagine a friend that's a surgeon just giving you back surgery and then getting that phone call, you know, it's like, are you, what? The, he didn't even believe the ER. He was like, no, not him. Yeah. Wow. It, yeah, I think it was a week and a half right after. That's unbelievable. And so yeah. what's that recovery like? That wasn't bad. That was a lot of, you know, you can't put a cast on the hip. He, they got it back in clean. I had broke, I don't know the right term, but the socket, the hip goes in. Uh-huh. I broke the edges. That's why I say I broke my hip. It came out so hard that it broke the edges off. Um, the surgeon said, the, you know, the cartilage in scar tissue would form at the ends and it would almost act like a support and go back to the way it was. And unless I did something like that again, it, I mean, I've done a little jujitsu. I ran the Moab 240. I, I just squatted this morning. So, and that's years from then. So yeah, just move on with life. <laughs> Seems like it's going yeah. pretty good. Yeah. Wow. Um, what about your shoulder? Yeah. Did you have any problem with your shoulder? No, it was a kind of the same thing. It didn't really, I don't want to say it like dislocated, but it went the wrong way too far. That was a lot of stretching, um, a, a lot of rehab, a lot of um, cups really helped me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just stuff like that. It didn't tear anything or anything like that. So it just kind of, you know, I stayed off a lot of ice baths and stuff like that. So just bounce back and ready to grind again, I guess. Wow. <laughs> and so after you break a after you break your hip like that and you're kind of coming back, how do you start running? Like 
Did did you just kind of that was, dream like that was I'm going of, to yes, run one day? That, that happened down in Costa Rica. So what I did was when I cut off the oxys, I was staying with my mother at the time. She comes home and I was literally I call myself the uh, remember the old Holiday Inn commercials with the the son that was like 50. He would come downstairs and he'd have a great idea and they'd like tell him to like you know piss off. Like, what do you think this is? A holiday in? Okay. Well, that, that was me that day. So I had a giant race board and uh, my mom comes walking in from work and I've got all my Costa Rica ideas written on this thing. I've got the budget. I got, I got money from the accident. I'm going to buy this boat from Moat Marine Laboratory. It was a 27 foot Morgan that they had that was donated to them. It was an old, uh, you know, the old tarpon boats they live baited out. Yeah. Yeah. So it was one of those. And okay. um, 27 foot Morgan, it was a 1988 and I'd already found it online and talked to Moat Marine because it's right here in Sarasota. And I had got about 18,000 from the, uh, the car accident, just from insurance. And the boat was 14. So I was like, I got four left over. I'm getting electronics and uh, I'm getting some fishing gear and some electronics and I'm moving back to Costa. My mom was like, yeah, okay. And then a month later, here's Jason overnight, you know, outside working on the boat, hooking up the outriggers. And she's like, Oh, okay. He's, <laughs> he's going, <laughs> I'd go to the store half day, fix jewelry. And then I'd come back home and work from about four o'clock till, you know, when I couldn't keep my eyes open and go to bed and do it again. And I did that for another year and I shipped the boat in 2008 and um, I was right behind it. By 2009, I was fishing. Wow. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Had it, and, had it shipped down there in a container. It was small enough to put in a container. I got some outriggers that could, um, some of those rep riggers that could fold down. Um, I actually, the, the part that you bolt onto the boat stayed on and the rest of them I took down there on my own in surfboard bags. Huh. Rolled them all up in bubble tape and you should have seen when customs saw that. They kind of looked at me and it's like, is he smuggling aluminum? <laughs> yeah. So, yep, took all my took all my gear down in those giant, you know, the big board bags on wheels. Uh-huh. All my fishing gear was in one and the the, the outriggers were in the other. Wow. And yeah. so you get that started? I got that I got that started. I was able to um work with the um the restaurant was called Mari Sol. That's uh, so, uh that's the sun in the ocean in Spanish. Um I was able to get with them. They had closed their business down by then, their fishing business. They realized uh, being Americans, being in Central America, a restaurant, and it was a fairly large restaurant. It was two story. They figured that was as much as they could they could do. So they closed down. So it was kind of a perfect timing thing. Again, I moved back. I wanted to get tourism, put some brochures in the restaurant. And, and you know, everything's about helping each other out down there, whether you're American, Costa Rican, whatever. So I jumped back in and, you know, got the business going. Hmm. That's awesome, man. And yeah. then how long did that last? That was, I was there till about, I want to say about mid 2013. Yeah. Yeah. Because then I moved to uh, Panama. Okay. Yeah. What what goes on in Panama? Panama is just, uh, think about, think about Costa Rica 20 years ago on the coast. That's where Panama is. Mm. Everybody thinks of Panama as Panama City and Panama City's got over 3 million people in it. But that's not the rest of the country. It's very open. It's very vast. Where um, where were you fishing there? I was in David, okay. Pedro Gal, so it was north. Okay, I don't know it, but I was, you know, Carter Andrews used to go down there. He used to be in Panama, and I was going to go he see in, him. He was in Isla Seca. Yeah, right. Yeah, that was some islands. I was in Isla Perita. I was I don't remember how many miles, but it wasn't very far. When I headed out to the fishing grounds. I saw Seca, Seca Islands okay. off, off my left. And so you yep. could do all of that fishing there in the same boat, or did you get a new boat? No, by by then I had a 32 Blackfin. Okay. I had moved yeah. home. I realized a lot of guys like, um, you know, fishermen, real real fishermen that came down, like I want to catch a billfish, I want to get a rooster on fly, but those kind of guys, they weren't, that boat wasn't going to fly. Mm-hmm. And I understood, you know, I yeah. knew it from being a fisherman, so – I sold it down there in Costa Rica and I took the money and I actually went up to Orange Beach, Alabama after they had one of the uh, storms Mm -hmm. and I bought a sunken uh, 32 Blackfin with twin uh, Cummins. Wow. And then you re, 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 re did (laughs) that. What um, is, what do you call it? It's, it's completely sunk. You, you re, re, uh, re re invigorate it. It's a, (laughs) (laughs) yeah, yeah. They were, the engines were underwater. Luckily they were diesel Cummins, you know, so you, you kick them on the side and you clean them off and they can go, but you got them going again. Rebuilds on them. 
Yeah, they were uh, the three fifteen six BTAs. Wow. Yeah. And 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 how and after that, once you get them going again, they they did fine. Pretty much, yeah. I mean, we Unbelievable. did. I mean, we did everything. We we I put new. Anytime there was some major repair, I just went ahead and replaced it, like mm-hmm. the spindles and the in the turbos and stuff like that, all replaced. I remember putting brand new um, cooling system on it. I went ahead because it was all jarred up. And then what I did was I had the old one. Everything that I could repair that I could afford to replace, I replaced it. And then I repaired the other one as a backup. Yeah. And yeah. how did you know how to do all this? I, self-taught? I did, I self-taught. Really? Self-taught. Like the story in the post, you know, like my first mate, he actually got up that morning when we were stuck out there and he woke me up and was like, let's go home. We know we know how to do this. And and we did. And it was something, it was jammed in the, um, it was the, it was actually the first boat and it was something jammed in the the, um, coolant system. That was a uh, Yanmar engine. So we fixed that. And then we had commercial netting around the prop and didn't even know it. So that was the two things we fixed the engine and then it starts running. We're like, all right, we're still not, you know, it's not wanting to go in the gear. So I was like, let me hop off. And, you know, I hopped off and saw it and was like, Duh. you know, that kind of stupid thing. So for the other two or three days that you're out there, you, you guys were just trying a few things and, and just. Day one, day one was kind of a, you know, the panic thing, like, oh, great. What do we do kind of thing? Um, day two was kind of let's have a beer and look it over, you know, kind of thing and just kind of, you know, assess it because it was serious. Mm-hmm. And nobody was coming to get us. And then day three, first thing in the morning after we had sessed in the morning, it's like, all right, let's, it's time to go home. Yeah. And then that was it. Yeah. Tear the whole thing down out there. Yep. Yeah. We just, <laughs> or as far as it part needed by to be, part. we started at the front with the belts and, and just kind of worked our way down the sides and, you know, this, this, and this, and it was, a, it was a coolant problem and it was, it was just not, it was not giving us enough power to even move the prop. Were and you, uh, uh, were you able to uh, <clears throat> hold your position or were you drifting? Oh, we were, we were a hundred miles offshore. <laughs> we were drifting. Yeah. <laughs> 2,000 feet of water or more. Yeah. And heading yeah. and heading 200 miles offshore. Yeah, yeah. And still heading. And, um, I didn't have, you know, I was learning at the time. I didn't have two batteries in the boat and I had about a 15 inch garment system. So that's sucking batteries. So we shut that down too. So what I do is just turn it on, um, in the morning and, and mark a spot and, you know, you're not moving too much, but you're, you're moving more than you think, mm-hmm. you know, currents probably, I'd say maybe two knots, probably about one, you know, in a surface actual current. And then you got your tides, of course, but the actual ocean current is not as fast, but, you know, put, put one mile an hour current to a 12 hour weight and a 24 hour weight. There's 24 right. miles. Yeah. Yeah. And so you make it out of that one. That's, that's you know? Yeah. You, you make it out of that one. And then, uh, at the, on these days, you've got two other passions that are really extraordinary. The, the running passion and then this elk hunting obsession. Um, how did, how did you yeah. kind of develop both of those? Um, the running actually came in Costa Rica. You know, I was down there for 11 years and about halfway through, you know, in the beginning, I mean, I, I mean, 2005, I was 25 years old. I'm having fun down there. I'm surfing, I'm drinking too much, you know, that kind of thing. And it was kind of like the oxy thing. Uh, I, I became friends with a lot of people like, um, you know, a lot of surfers and stuff. Everybody's in real good shape. There was a lot mm-hmm. of paddleboarders that lived there. And I was like, that that's so much more fun than what I'm doing, you know, <laughs> drinking all night and then crawling onto a boat, trying to do a charter the next morning. So I actually lived at a hotel called Flamingo Marina's resort and they had their own little beach and I had stairs, spiral stairs. It was beautiful. A spiral staircase right down to that beach. So I just started running up and down that star, spiral staircase. And then I found off a, I don't know what kind of rock it was. The big, it wasn't lava rock, but it was like granite. I think there's a lot of granite down there. Don't hold me to that but a piece had broken off. And you know, when you're um, lobster hunting off the back of the boat and you got that sled, Mm -hmm. well, this piece of rock was shaped almost identical to one of those. Hmm. So I started and the beach was very angled. So what I started doing was picking it up over my head, throwing it ahead of me, like frog jumping up to it in soft sand and then throwing it again. 
And then I started walking out in the water and doing like what the surfers do in Hawaii. They're holding, mm-hmm. a, they're holding the rock underwater because mm-hmm. I had that beach. And, you know, you get that addiction. I was like, you know, every morning my mate would come get me and he'd usually come up because he was the night guard on the boat, too, because we we're on moorings. So he would come up for breakfast and I was never there. I was always down on the beach. So and then he started showing up. So it was nice. kind of, a, you know, it was a chain reaction. Yeah. And um, I just started doing that. And then a big goal was they had a little gym there called, uh, I want to say it was called the monkey. It used to be the monkey bar. And then it was the monkey gym. And uh, my goal was to be able to do that workout in the morning and then do a full charter and be able to go to the gym at night. And it was just, you know how it is. You're, yeah. People think a charter guy's just kind of hanging out on a boat. And <laughs> it's, you know, you're out in the sun, you're moving around, you're, you're talking with people. There's mental, there's, if you're not catching anything, you're like, you know, yeah. And by the time I got home, I was like, no, I'm not going to the gym. And then finally I, I went to the gym one night and it was great. And then six days a week I was doing every, if I had a charter, I went to the gym. Yeah. That's what it was. That was the rule. I I found that, you know, I used to run after, after charters or even before charters sometimes, but sometimes that got to be just, just. That's un- unrealistically early when yeah. you're leaving the dock at five 30 it's like, are you really going to wake <laughs> up at three to go running? And you try that a few times and it's just like, you know, maybe the afternoon, but, but in the keys, it's, it's so hot, you know, in the summertime. And it, it so it was kind of like, well, I don't know, three sounds pretty good, you know, instead of running yeah. in the that's, afternoon that's and really you get off the water, it's like three 30 or four and thinking, okay, well, I knew this, that if I got off the water and I walked into the house and hit that AC, I wasn't going to come back out. It's too nice. Sometimes I would come in, I would be so hot from fishing that I would come in and I would take my shirt off and take my pants off and lay down on the cold tile floor and just lay there. Cold tile floor, the colder, the better, and just lay there and be like, oh my God, I feel like I'm about to have a heat stroke. But then, you know, when I started running down there, I would leave my shoes outside because if I walked in, it was over. And so I would just <laughs> I would just have my shoes someplace, either in my truck yeah. or someplace, and I would just change clothes and never walk inside and then just go for the run. And every time I felt like, boy, I just don't have the energy to do this. And you get out there and about a mile, maybe two miles in, you feel great again. You're good. I don't, I can't explain it, but it's yeah, like more effort equals yeah. more energy and yeah. you're already wiped out, but, yeah. but then you and go the and do that. Brutal. When the wind dies, Ooh. the keys, oh, it just. Well, even I the mean, wind, you know, like that's what, that's what all the runners say in the keys is like the wind is our hills because yeah. you're running into a 20 mile an hour wind, you know, and somehow you turn around and you're still running into the wind. I don't know how that works, but. <laughs> You know what I mean? That's what they say about Hawaii. You know, I don't know what this, he can run like the wind. I'm always running against the wind. I've, I've been out here where I go over one of my bridges. And what I do is I, I'm I'm close to Siesta Key, the Island. I go over the bridge and the winds in my face. I run down uh, Siesta Key to a uh, fire station. I, I tap one of the, they got a monument out there. So I tap the monument and I turn around. I'm like, the winds in my face. Yeah. How does that work? I went one road. I didn't change direction. I'm going east the entire time down the island, and it's in my face again. <laughs> mm-hmm. Occasionally, <laughs> no occasionally it's it's downwind, but yeah, um, you know that that is a weird thing. But that that uh, that deal about more effort equaling more energy it, it's absolutely the case. And uh, I don't know. That's that's cool that you were doing that. So you were able to do the morning workout, do a charter, and do the do the gym workout. That was, that uh, was the whole goal. I could do the morning, and I did the morning thing every day because we went to the boat every day. I mean, there's you know you know how it is. There's always something you can do on a boat. There's, mm-hmm. there's, I mean, even if it's walking around, changing out screws that are starting to rust with a with a new one, um, mm-hmm. cleaning something, polishing an outrigger. There's a, sharpening hooks i mean there's there's if anybody says they have everything done on their boat you're not the ones running the boat right you know yeah they're not they're running the boat but they ain't fixing it you know (laughs) so i did the workout and then my mate would come around the corner the cove was around the corner from that little beach and he'd pick me up in a little um zodiac and i'd hop on right from there i'd have his breakfast ready sitting on the beach and we'd go to the boat for the day 
Nice. They did that every so day. just so I'm clear, this is already after you've had this sciatic problem and and had the wreck. Yes. And that so, all happened in between the 2005 and the 2008 that right. I went back down there. I did and a couple so, of those redfish tournaments, got injured. When you start um, kind of the, the rock workout and the – you know, the beach workouts and the stair workouts, were you having any issues with it or did you heal up well enough or the stairs, the stairs were, um, I mean, they were straight up, they were wood plank stairs and they were going right up to that hotel. So they, they were brutal. I, it was, uh, it was definitely a walk in the beginning <laughs> mm-hmm. for, for sure. Cause I wasn't in that kind of shape. I mean, I'm, I'm tall and long, but I mean, it went from a walk to skipping a couple steps, almost like a lunge. Uh-huh. And then um, I was doing the, so I was doing the rock hop thing to the stairs and then running up the stairs and running down. Yeah. But, but the, you didn't feel like, I mean, there's one thing, you know, there's one thing to be in shape. It's another thing to still be kind of dealing, working your way through or around an injury. If I did back then, Tom, I don't remember it now. So yeah. it wasn't enough. I mean, I'm sure I had days where back then I was like, Oh, not, not tomorrow. You know, let's just go to the boat. Mm-hmm. But I don't remember of like significant yeah, where I was out for. That's awesome, man. That you, you know, out. that's a major, that's a major injury, a major surgery, major, yeah, you know, then re injury again. Like that's, that's pretty, that's pretty good that yeah. you got good doctors, I guess, or, or yeah, it just yeah. happened nicely yep. to be able to get yep. put together it's incredible. to where you can do those kind of things. That's amazing. Yeah. I actually just recently saw my doctor in uh, Publix and I told him about the Moab 240 and he just kind of blinked at me. <laughs> like, you or one of your buddies? I was like, no, me. So, it's called uh, Kennedy White Orthopedic here in town. He actually is going to have one of the pictures of me and Moab blown up and put in the hospital. Oh, right so on. Cool. And they've done a bunch of professional athletes and stuff like that. So I wow. just, um, I just, uh, he just picked out the picture actually two days ago and I'm going to get it done over at Walgreens and he's going to put it up in the office. So that was pretty cool. That is pretty cool. So there's yeah. a big difference between running down the beach a little bit and doing some stairs and, and doing two workouts a day. And then setting your sights on a 50 miler, a hundred miler and a 240. And then what yeah. I saw on your, on your Instagram is that you were unsuccessful in the 50 and the 100 and then successful in the 240. The 240. So the let's talk about that for a minute. Like, how do you, how do you go from, you know, those type of workouts and everything to wanting to run that kind of distance? Um, well, I, uh, like I was saying earlier, before we had the camera on, I moved back about, uh, sometime in 2017, um, 2018, my best friend passed away. Mm. He was hit by a car changing his own tire in the middle oh, of the man. night. He had, Sorry to hear that. he had gotten an argument or something with his girlfriend and he's like, you know, I'm over it. I'm going to go back to my house for the night and we'll talk in the morning. And he was changing his tire and he got hit mm. by a car and they never found out who did it. That person took off and it was unsolved as of now. Dang. So that was, that was an eye opener. You know, that, that wakes you up too, when you lose somebody like that. And he actually dro- quit his job twice when I was in Costa Rica, just to come down and help me. So that's what that kind of friend, I mean, left everything, showed up with a uh, suitcase and was like, I heard you needed a hand kind of like, Oh, okay, let's do this. And he ended up spending a year with me uh, in 2009. He spent a year with me and then he moved home. And then he's actually the one that helped me get the black fin that I was telling you about the 32 ready. And he helped me ship it back down there. And we had shipped it into Capos, Costa Rica, which is down there in the Los Sueños area where the Marina is. Yeah. I've been there. He spent about six months with me getting it ready. And then when we got it ready in the Marina and we got our papers, he moved home again. And I moved back up to Flamingo where I was in the beginning. Okay. So, I mean, that, that kind of friend, may never find that again, you know, to yeah. somebody who just, Oh, Jason needs help. So I'll quit everything and move. <laughs> I mean, he left his bills, his job and everything. Wow. But in 2018, he needed help and he was great with his hands. He was a boat detailer. That's what he did. Um, he was actually over at Ingman Marine where they have Pathfinder and all that. Okay. Um, um, he was the boat detailer and he needed, you know, he wanted to get a career and I knew he was, I knew he was good. He was super careful. So I actually sent him to jewelry school. And I had sent him in 2018 in August and he passed away in September. Wow. He passed away right after, right after he went to school. That was it. Man, that's tough. So that was the, that was the wake up. And in 2000, he was from Philadelphia and he was a diehard, you know, those guys. And 
if they like sports, they, they like their sports. <laughs> and um, so that, that kind of, I wanted to go see his family and I wanted to do something to honor him. So I ran the Philadelphia marathon in 2019. Okay. That was a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had started running like three months before that. I was like, yeah, I'm doing this. And everybody's like, good luck. Hope you finish. And I was like, I'm finishing. Come on. I, I did finish, but it was, it was brutal. It hailed. <laughs> I had 30 mile an hour wind and it rained the entire time and it was 40 degrees. And this is a guy from Florida. Yeah. I was like, Thanks Philly. You know, <laughs> if Philly can be brash on you, that's, that's what Philly does, you know? So I did finish. I ran a 454. Um, I, uh, the, the, fa- the whole family was at the finish line and I got the hug mom and I gave her the shirt off my back. Literally that had uh, his nickname was Wooly. We had a shirt made that was called Go Willy, Wooly, and um, I, ga- I gave her that. We had dinner, and I took off, and that was in, that was the uh, 2019. Uh, so that would have been in November. That's okay. when they held that marathon. So after that, you know, I kind of it was kind of like the beach thing. I, I liked that feeling, and I wanted to keep it going. So then I and then you know right after that was the pandemic. Mm-hmm. So it was um, you know, and we're a jewelry store, so we're not you know, you're thinking, nobody's thinking jewelry during a pandemic, you know? Um, so we slowed way down. And what we did was we closed for about four weeks when it got real bad, that, that transition in the very beginning of 19 going into 2020. And for about four weeks, what we did is everybody stayed on and we just finished all our jobs instead of taking on, you know, having doors open. So it was kind of a benefit. And I remember going in about a half day and just being home, like, you know, this, this guy's got to do something, you know, it'd be like somebody taking your boat away. Right. Yeah. It was like, so I just, every day going out the door, going for a run, I went, I went before work, I'd just go for a little jog. And then after I got back, I'd get home about, you know, like three o'clock or so. And it was like, you know, I got the rest of the day. Let's, let's get out there and and do it again. And I've never stopped. And (laughs) the, uh, the 50 mile run was actually, people don't realize this. That was on my own. That wasn't a race. Mm-hmm. I I was preparing for the Moab and um, I wanted to do, um, I, I remember watching a bunch of videos before I knew the gentleman, Cam Haynes, and you know, a lot of his training was overnight. So, and I did, I did start to do some night runs, nothing, nothing like 50, but I built up to the 50 and I went out to a place called the Celery Field. It's a park here in Sarasota that has a pretty good size hill. It's a couple hundred feet high. I mean, it's Florida. Yeah. <laughs> um, I used to run, I, I used to run to the parking garage in Key West and run up the, there up and go. down the parking yeah. garage. That was the, that was the tallest point in the whole keys. It, like, it had to be in the yeah. keys. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and, um, I, I used to run the parking garage at the hospital here until they threw me out. <laughs> it got too busy and they, they, they thought I was some weird person in the middle of the night, always yeah. in the parking garage. They're like, you gotta go dude. Um, but anyways, so I wanted to simulate, trying to be up all day and up all night running. So what I did was I did a normal day at work. I went to the gym and then I usually go to bed about 10 30. So instead of going to bed, I went to run. Yeah. So, and I wanted to run from the time I went to bed at 10 30 to the time I would have got up in the morning and gone to the gym or gone running. So I ran till about, uh, it was a little later. I ran till about 7 AM. Dang. And, I got, I got about 45 miles out of the 50. That's why I say I didn't complete it. And I passed out twice. <laughs> I woke up, I woke up in a ditch, kind of like, I didn't even know where I was. I was like, what am I doing at the celery field? And then I looked up, oh yeah, this idiot's training for the Really? Moab. No, no yeah. support. Nothing. N- nothing, nothing. They had, um, on one side of the park is a, a regular concrete parking lot with like a bathroom and a water fountain. And think about just a big square. And then so I parked my car with supplies on the other side. Right. So that was my two rest stops. And I would stop at those. And I had a little uh, Yeti cooler in the back. And then the other side had a water fountain. And don't get me wrong. I had a backpack with stuff on. You know, the I, yeah. I wore all the gear that I would run in Moab. Right. I right. had water bottles on the front. And I had the backpack. And I had some protein stuff. I had everything I needed. I just, I think what got me was it was in July. The bugs. Oh, yeah. I, I think I succumbed to mosquitoes. Yeah, well, I was, that's a bad one. I was, 
all swollen. I did a ruck, I did a, a a ruck run one time from Hawks K up to Layton and back, and went through the uh, Long Key State Park. And I guess they don't spray for mosquitoes there. And I got swarmed. I mean, swarmed like if you went to mosquito went to uh, Flamingo in the morning and just got out and hung out at the boat ramp without without any. Yeah, that's, <laughs> I mean, the, just the swarmed, no joke for that swarmed. Either. But you know, if yeah. you're sweating enough, if you're sweating enough, you can keep them off of you. It, Barely. Yeah. <laughs> no. Because, but you have to be super hydrated. But I mean, there's like a, there's like a, a cascade of, of sweat coming off and you can actually keep them off a little bit, but that's that I got swarmed on that, on that run. That was, oh, that was I, crazy. I and then you're rocking. So you're not moving. You're going speed. so you're slow. Kinda, yeah. You know, you're just I mean, comparatively. Through. Yeah. <laughs> you're going yeah. super slow. So between the marathon and this 50 miler, um, did you like have a program or did you have any, you just were interested, you wanted to do I, it and you just did it. Every, yeah, everything, everything I read about, you know, I was basing it all on the Moab. I, I wanted to do the Moab someday. I wasn't signed up or anything like that. Then um, the biggest thing was you have to change it up because I read all these training, you know, everybody's got a training video for Moab out there. Well, when you talk to the real guys, like, like later on in life, I became friends with Cam Haynes and all those guys out in Oregon. You know, I asked him about a training regiment and he just rolled his eyes. And I was like, all right, I'm, I'm doing it right. You, you, it's just time on the feet. Yeah. It's time on the feet. So I would run the beach barefoot. I would run the road in the middle of the day, you know, on a lunch break. Um, I'd go back to that hill and run it in like boots, you know, anything to make it harder than, than what I thought it was going to be, you know? Nice. And so then, then once you get to the, the, that 50 and then the, do you have your site set on a hundred next or. Um, I did that, that next year. So that would have been 2020 in July. That next year I ran the hundred, it was called the forgotten Florida 100 up in Ocala national park. Mm -hmm. And that was an official race um, that I didn't complete. And that was a hundred mile. I was going for 24 hours and um, I got to uh, 75.2. Um, I didn't realize later after I had dropped out that I was actually in first place for most of the race <laughs> and I got lost. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I remember, I remember getting lost and I called up the director and he's like, well, you know, thanks for being honest. And, you know, we see on the thing, if you, if you go back and do this and this and cut back through here, you can keep going. And, um, I knew I wasn't going to get the 24 hour by then. So I got to a spot. My mom was my crew, my mom and my aunt. They're, they're sitting there in my car to like 45 degree weather. It's pouring down rain. Um, uh, my hamstring was starting to lock up, my left hamstring. And I remember pulling up to them and that was the 75.2 and they're standing in the rain. And I was like, nah, hmm. that's it. Could I have finished? I mean, I didn't. So I can't say I did, but. I was on hour 17, so I was going pretty good at 17 or at 75 miles, and I had till 32. So could I have ran 25 miles in, in, in another 15 hours? Probably, you know, or even walked it. I, yeah. I just so I, I it was weird. I lost all mindset. It, it just the mental just beat me up. I remember seeing them. I wish I would have never seen them because what I did was I actually hurt my leg at 60 miles. And I had saw them there and I was like, all right, well, let me go, let me go 15 more. There's two more rest areas with those guys in the middle and they won't take you back till the end. So even if I quit, I got to sit there. Well, let me get through one more. And my plan at 75 was let me get one more. Mm -hmm. And I did it at 60 and I did it through the two that I saw, you know, the crew members, the volunteers. And then when I got to them, I, I just sat on the back of the truck and it was kind of like you're um, doing a charter and going in the house AC like Yeah. I messed up and I got in the truck and I was out of the rain and I was like, Oh, it's so nice. And, and I can go home. And so, so it's interesting <laughs> it? to, it's interesting to know that later you complete the 240, which is the ultimate yeah. goal. So I wonder like when you look back on it now, what lessons did you learn from not completing that 100 and the stopping at the 76 or 75 uh, or the, well, uh, number one was like, uh, 
my mom being there and saying, you know, you should have finished when I was the one trying to get her out of the rain kind of mindset. She's like, no, we're, we're here for you. I'm okay. And then um, five days later after the run, I was running on this bad hamstring. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, it was, you know, it was all up here. I'm, Oh, I'm going to quit. My hamstring hurts. And then five days later, I ran to the gym, worked out and ran home. I was like, it wasn't an injury. You know, I might've been dehydrated a little, but you know, it was kind of, and what happened was that was, uh, that was 2021. And I was actually signed up for Moab that year. I went out, that was my first elk hunt too. So uh, part of that post that you read back to me, that's the first, that's the second year that I went out and saw Wayne Indicott and Lisa at the, at the bow rack. And I was training out there as well. And I had gotten COVID real bad. Uh. Um, and I had, a, I only had it for a couple of days, but then I ended up getting a flu from somebody after. So that gave me like the regular fever and all that. And that was in August and Moab was in October and it, it wasn't going to happen. So I actually dropped out with not even showing up. And then, so that gave me more time mentally to go for it in this last year. So when you're, you know, like we're just kind of zipping through this thing. Yeah. But what, what I know just from my own endeavors is that when you have a, a, call it a failure, call it a misstep, call it a, something didn't work out quite the way you wanted it to. Um, that's, that can be mentally very difficult to get over. Like you feel like, man, I, I quit. You know, I was just trying to do, made a mistake. It could be whatever, right? Like what were you able to deal with the, with the mental kind of disappointment or was there disappointment, you know, that, that you weren't able to finish the 100 and then how do you, Um, how do you kind of rebound and reset and get back to, to what you were, you know, to your original goal? Right, right. Where I was before I failed. Well, number one, I actually, this sounds kind of weird, but I love failure. Mm -hmm. Failure for some reason wakes me up so much. It's just, what did, you know, what did I do wrong? What would I, all that woulda, coulda, I jump on that right after I fail. Because yeah, you can do that from a year from now. Oh, I wish I would have ran 240. I wish I would have, you know, like, like, for you, for instance, if you hadn't gone to one of those um, boot camps, you were talking about the Navy SEAL thing, or imagine if you hadn't finished one, you know, you'd have been drooling, you know, to get on another one. I can tell by your attitude, you would have jumped back on it. I, I do that like right at the failure. And I did that that day at the gym. When I ran to the gym five days later after that run, I was like, what am I, I should be home in bed if I'm not hurt, you know? <laughs> So, you know, I, I should be limping. I should be, you know, but I wasn't, I wasn't hurt. It was a hydration thing. And, um, yeah, but even that, even that when you're training for like this bigger, like now we're talking about something that's more than twice, way more than twice what you're, what you encounter at the failure point, almost triple. but, and so it's like, okay, well, if you do learn that it is hydration, that's a win. Right. Like, because you're going to get out there, you're going to make the trip all the way out to Moab. And this yep. is one thing that you've learned that you can handle, that you can control, that you can, you know, practice before you get there. You can make sure that right. this isn't going to happen again. And, you know, that's that's a big win. A lot of people don't yep. see it as a win. A lot of people see that as the, a, a major failure. But yeah, no, that was a win. That one, um, when I went out on the Moab, um, I went out on that Florida I mean, it was my first race. I had no business trying to win, you know, and that's what I did. So, you know, 90% of newcomers to anything go out too fast. So I made sure in the Moab, I was in the middle, you know, I was like, I want to find the slowest guy. Well, well, hang I want him beating me. I want to know, I want, I want to get to the Moab thing and I want to know what that, what that is like to, uh, to step onto the line. And I guess we might as well just talk about it now, but you go to Moab, you're going to this iconic race where there's no one there <laughs> i mean everyone there deserves to be there like and and it's your first race yeah and you're is. looking around and you see all these people that you've heard of and you've seen and read about what is that like to be amongst those type of people at at that type of event with this 240 miles ahead of you in a harsh environment like what is that like 
when you step up to that line? Um, it didn't hit me at the line. I mean, I did. I still had the butterflies, but it hit me the night before at the check-in when you had to go and show what your gear, you had to have certain kind of gear. Um, you had to, I believe you had to have a certain size water bag. And it was all previous pros and winners that were checking over your stuff. And you had to do a medical exam. And I was like, oh, God, what if they hear about the hip? You know, I'm going to lie about everything. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when it hit me. I was like, oh, I, I have to do this in the morning at 6 a.m. Yeah. It, well, I mean, a lot of people me. could be, you know, you could get there and they're like, you don't have the right size water bag. And a lot of people could be like, oh, my God, I don't deserve to be here. What am I? And And all of a sudden the doubt starts creeping in at that point, like. Just because I had everything right. <laughs> so I couldn't get out of that. So the one thing that I did, what you're about to say was um, when the guy, um, there was one guy that wanted to check over your mapping and I had it on my phone, right. But then I had it on my watch wrong. And he's like, all right, well, we're going to have to get this done and get it on there. I can't check in. And I was like, I almost want to go, well, I don't, I don't have to run it. If it's, you know, the watch. Yeah, 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 right. yeah. He's like, oh, really? It's not like, right. Oh, uh, maybe I'll just try next year. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of. And he goes, "Get your ass to medical. I'll fix your watch for you." And, uh -huh. You know, and he literally did. So while I was in the medical. He fixed the watch, and he comes up and he, he's like, "You can run it now." And I was like, eh, "Thank, thanks, yeah, gee, thanks, thanks, buddy, thanks." I guess I'll show up in the morning. Yeah. Um, the uh, the actually um, what took the butterflies away that morning was uh, my mom and my aunt were my crew again. And they had not downloaded any of the apps or anything to track me. So that morning, I'm getting ready to leave. I literally ran with their phone in my hand for a little bit. Um, we kind of went down this hill and we went around a corner where I would see them like 500 yards later. And I was downloading the app while I was jogging and handed back the phone to them. <laughs> yeah. So that kind of, that killed the butterflies. You know, I was like trying to download the app thing's going around. I'm like, come on. I, 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 I can't stop and hang out. You know, I got to go. <laughs> so then I literally, it was like a football handoff. I handed it to mom and I was like, I'll see you. I think the first one was 19 miles. I was, I was like, I'll see you in 19. Ah, that was it. So that, that took the butterflies, but going under the, the big destination trail run overpass, I kind of looked up at it like a boat going under a bridge, mm -hmm. you know, it was kind of like we're, we're, it's here it's time let's go yeah sometimes but the butterflies man, were the night before at the check-in sometimes those big events that you train for i'm thinking about girl selection i had this thing on my phone and it was this countdown and i started it like a year before and it's like you got 364 <laughs> days until go ruck selection and then every day it's just getting a little bit you know yeah. and you're you're training and it's like man i'm not there yet but look i've got 187 more days to hit these standards and i'm going to i'm going to be there and everything's That's going a good well way to do it yeah and then i remember yeah. I, I i actually have a screenshot of it and it's like you have zero days until go rock selection. I was like, <laughs> Oh my God, <laughs> yeah. that, that happened so fast. Like how did that happen? But oh, you, man, I didn't do that run. Can I still oh, get it in? No, no, no you're going, you're going. <laughs> yep, um, going. So one of the things like uh, about an event like that is um, hydration, nutrition, and having never run that distance, how did you practice and prepare for, for that kind of um, stuff. I did. I did. I didn't do a lot of the one thing I did learn. I looked at, I, I looked at a lot of stuff online of those training regiments. And, you know, like I was saying, Cam said that was kind of, you know, but what I did see was I saw people's like, I found not really their failures, but things that you wanted to look out for. Like um, I found out that a lot of people, it's hard for them to eat um, while they're running. So I packed food on my training runs, even if I was running eight miles, yeah. I brought like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and, 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 you know, I stopped, I didn't eat it while running. I I'd stop, I'd eat, I'd hydrate. And then I'd take off again. And my, my stomach started to get used to having that. And um, I remember being at one of the rest stops and I ate like four cheeseburgers mm -hmm. and the guy was like, the guy was like, good, good, good man. Not a lot of people do that. So I knew um, stuff like that. Um, I would overhydrate in the morning. I'd wake up just a little earlier you know, the morning run, you want to, you want to smash a glass of water and go out the door. You know what I mean? So what I would do is um, I got up a little earlier. I'd get a thermos. I'd drink a little more than I should walk the dogs kind of like wake up and then take them back to the house. But I wanted to get that hydration. Um, um, 
the dehydration from the hamstring in the 100 race. Um, what my goal was, I remember being in that race when I was in first place and I was around 40 miles. It was 40 something. And a lady picks up my backpack. She takes it off me to refill it for me. And she goes, son, you have way too much liquid in here. Think about that. And I was like, ah, and I didn't think about it then in the 100. I was like, whatever, I got this. I'll, I'll run it. Yeah. Well, there's, there's Jason at 75 quitting. But I remember that in Moab. Um, so my goal was when I was getting close to another rest area, I wanted my water gone. Mm -hmm. I wanted it gone. Mm -hmm. And that helped me out a lot because we got to a rest area one time where a lot of people got there at once and they were actually turning people down for refilling multiple times. So, um, and then what happened was I remember I was refilling and I was going to chug that and then just refill again and go. And the guy goes, there's no second refill. So I was like, all right, I had about half down. And he goes, no worries. Four more miles is another water station. So I took off for that one because I could, you know, what's four miles in that thing. Mm -hmm. So I get there and there's a guy kicking a bucket down the, down the uh, gravel drive there. And I was like, oh, they're out of water too. Mm. And there was no, there was no man at that station. Nobody was manning that station. It was out of water. Um, I remember it was either 57 or 67 people dropped out at that um, because the next one after that. So you had one you had one that I could refill at. Then you had the one at four more miles later that was out of water. The next one was 27 miles. Dang. Yeah. So I went 27 miles with about that much water in my back. Dang. And there were people just dropping out like flies. I'm they sure. Were just yeah, I found, um, I am, I mean, obviously I was struggling too, but I found two ladies that were doing it too. And we decided, you know, all of us were going to get through it. And we all ran together to the next stop and we made it. We had to stop Man. a few times. We shared water. One of the, one of the ladies had gotten um, a double refill at the first one. So she had a little more and we, we, we traded, you know, I had some snacks and, and we got through it. And then we all went on our own. How much were you paying attention to electrolytes? Yeah. <laughs> Not at all. Um, I was, I was pretty good. I mean, the staff there was pretty good. Like when you ran up, they would say, do you have enough electrolytes? You got any um, goo, you know, those gummies. Yeah. So every time they would say something, I kind of, you know, woke up and said, yeah, yeah, give me some of those. And then um, I think it's called tailwind. Mm -hmm, yeah. That was one of the sponsors. And, and I had never had that, their formula. But I ended up loving it, and it sat great with my stomach. So I was, I was almost never drinking regular water. I was doing the tailwind because the way they mixed it was half and half. Mm -hmm. So I was getting a lot more water than you think. But I love their stuff, so I would do that formula of drinking one down and then filling another one. So I had mm -hmm. one in my gut and then one on my back. Yeah, and then I had two bottles here. Yeah, yeah, that stuff really works. I mean, like, so yeah, you can go I a long way. It. I'm a big believer of it now. Yeah, that and and there's a couple other products that are kind of like that, like that are designed for like you can go like what is that other one that I liked? I don't know what it was, but um, you can go for a long time. The only other one I used was the and it wasn't a liquid; it was the gummies from Goo mm. to you. Mm -hmm. That's I had a ton of those, and then you know we had this big thing that my aunt um, Vicky and my mother were going to cook for me when I got to the car and everything. The staff there, they had great food. Destination trail runs had everything. So we learned we they learned had, on the fly to just use their they stuff. They had great they food. Just, like what kind of – when, you, when oh, you're running that kind of distance, like even, you know, you run a marathon or you run a 20 – you do a 20-miler, sometimes you come in and you're just like, man, I don't know what it is, but I got to have something with some ketchup on it. You know, I got to have something with – you know, I, I need some pancakes like now. Like what, what did, what kind of stuff did you bean burritos and they had bacon cheeseburgers. What did you want? Bacon cheeseburgers. That's what you um, wanted. I, ate, I wanted that the salt first time man. and I ran pretty, pretty fast after that. So I was like, let's stick with the bacon cheeseburgers. And then, you know, pickles have a lot of salt. So yeah. I would do a couple of pickle shots and I would load my cheeseburger up with pickles. Yeah. There you go. I, I well, that's where that you're getting your electrolytes. Formula. I mean, What's that? That's where you're getting your electrolytes plus yeah. protein and fat and carbohydrates too. Yeah, I mean, I had a but, bun, so I had carbs. I had bacon, so I had protein and fat. I had a hamburger, so I had protein. I had the pickles that had the sodium and the and the um, and yeah. the electrolytes, like you said. I mean, the burger was it. So I would just smash a bunch of those, and we had a uh, I had a reclining chair, and I would sit in that. By the time I had done with the burgers, it was it was time to go. 
Is it hard I to get out of that for, reclining in the four chair? Days I did it. I slept for three hours total. Really? Yeah. Did you hallucinate? Um, I did. I I think I. I got right on the verge of hallucination. It was later in the thing. And I've got a post where I was talking about where I went to Cam Haynes book and I had it on my audio book and I knew I was going to listen to it um, during the race. And um, I got to a point where, so there was a, there was a big mountain over here and my trail went away from it, but I had to get to that mountain eventually and it was at night and I was by myself and that really messed with me. My mind kept saying, you got to go to the mountain. You got to go <laughs> to the mountain. Well, I'd look on my map. I was literally arguing with the map. I'm like the mountains right there. But I had a, um, the, uh, the uh, rest area was called needles. And I remember kept going. I wanted to go that way. My body literally wanted to cross a cow field and just go to the mountain for mm -hmm. some reason. Cause it was, it. you know, I could see it. It was in my mind. I mean, it was there, but that was the most mind screwed up I was. Hmm. I remember seeing a coyote. Like he was going to eat me, even though he was like 20 pounds. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, and I that mountain really effed me up. I was ready to I, it just going the opposite way of where I knew I had to be in a 240 mile run. And then I got to I got to the uh, rest area called Needles. I put my feet up. I had my burger. I had some hot chocolate. Um, I pounded a, a coffee. It was it was like um, um, some guys I knew from the trail that showed up behind me. And he's like, come on, you're coming with us. And then I was like, all right, I'm out. And then that was it. And I never had another mind thing. Wow. Even people at the end, when I got in, I did, uh, I have a picture online where I was doing clapping push-ups. I was at my best in the last 30 miles. Hmm. I felt great. Isn't I stayed up awesome? and had beers with a bunch of guys. I was I was up with staff. I was like folding tables and stuff. You'd have thought I was working there. And I was fine. <laughs> now the next day I was, you know, the the swelling came in and all that. But that night I was, you know, one of the guys. I'd have thought I never ran it. What kind of calorie intake did you have in the next 24 hours? Did you want to um, eat or did you not feel like well, eating? Well, it was kind of funny. As a as a gift, my mother booked me a really cool campsite in Red Rock. But she didn't tell me that checkout was at 9 a.m. the next morning. <laughs> <laughs> so I got done at like nine o'clock at night. And by the time I was screwing around with the with the you know the closing and watching the other people come in, it was like midnight. So I got back. So at 9 a.m. here I am putting a putting a um, an RV back together, you know, with these swollen feet, and I had to drive home. Oh so I, my god! I didn't anywhere else. Drive yeah, so home. Where's home? The next morning for five days from Utah, I drove straight home and went to work. Oh my god! Yeah. <laughs> so I ate. Um, so you asked me about the calorie thing. It was a lot of Cool Ranch Doritos and and gummy bears. And the worst pain was getting out of the car to fill up my my fuel tank to just get out for a second, you know, cause you sit in the car, you settle down, Yeah. you know, that's on any kind of pain. Once you settle down, you don't want to move again, but to get out for fuel, it was brutal. I'd get out and kind of like go up to the thing and, you know, I'd go sit on the edge of the, of the tailgate while it filled. And yeah, that was the most brutal part. But once I got home, you know, it was pancakes and elk meat and, and I got back on the good stuff right mm -hmm. away. Nice. What, uh, when you finish the, the 240, what kind of, uh, what kind of, uh, lessons can you take back to your, to your regular life? The, the biggest thing is, you know, I'm, I'm like you, I'm an outdoor guy and now I'm, I'm managing and doing repairs in a jewelry store again. I think the biggest thing is there's things in life you might look at that are that big a deal but they're, they're not that big a deal, you know, like um, a due date on a job. I mean, I know we got to get it done. It's the customer's job, but if we have to call them and ask for an extra day, yeah, I'm not going to pull my hair out anymore. I ran 240 miles, you know, and I don't tell that person that, but to me, I'm not going to get stressed over that. I get a flat tire. I'm going to just get out and change it and put some Bob Marley music on and change the tire and move out my day. You know, um, I take, I go out with a guide like you and, and I want to catch a bonefish on a fly and we don't get it that day. Okay. You know, I was out fishing. I got to throw, I got to throw a fly at one of the hardest fish on the planet to catch. It's not that big a deal. Even if I went five days and didn't get one, I'm going to go home and, you know, Tom, I'll see you next year. Let's go. You know, that, that kind of stuff. Um, 
the 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 minor stuff. Um, I got one of my one of my dogs right now is a little sick, and it's 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 not pull your hair out kind of thing. It's let's get her to the vet, and you know let's figure it out and let's move on. It's it's taken the smaller things in life and just crushed them. Mm. It would be bad, you know that that kind of thing. Uh, the pandemic, whatever. Uh, I bring it. You know what I mean? You know, yeah. whatever, whatever comes ahead, just it's, it's brought me way down. I don't worry about things as much. Yeah. How about, how about in your elk hunting endeavors? I'm, uh, I'm about at the same, maybe time into the sport as you, maybe, maybe I got a little bit more. My boys have been out in Montana state. They've, one of them's finished with Montana state. One of them is a, is kind of a junior at Montana state. And Ever since my oh, older so out there, out there. Yeah. Okay. And ever since cool. my, my older son has been out there, which has been about it's been five five years, we've been elk hunting. And uh he he was, you know, really obsessed with it and is really, really obsessed with with the elk hunting. And the first couple of years I just went along as support. I didn't want him to get eaten by a grizzly bear. I was gonna be there to help pack out. Of course, yep. we it's much harder than a lot of people give it credit for. We were unsuccessful the first three years and then, um, or maybe four years. I think we were unsuccessful for four years. Well, then you're one or one or two ahead of me. I'm, I'm two years unsuccessful. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. it, it, but you know, it could, it could happen. You know, I was just talking to another guy that was on the podcast and he, he went out first time smokes one right away. Like, I don't know. I mean, it's the same thing with fishing. You know, you talk to people and they're yeah. like, permit fishing is hard. I don't know. I went and caught three the first day I was out there. Okay. Well, I mean, that's, then you know, talk to another guy. He's, he's been doing it for seven, eight years. He hasn't caught one yet. I don't know. Sometimes, sometimes they're doing well, something I'll wrong. Have, sometimes I'll they're not. come see eventually. Cause I've never caught a permit. Yeah. Well, it's we can, the- we can do both and, and elk it's- hunting too. Um, but yeah. in the, in the elk hunting, then my son finally, finally gets it done. And, uh, then we did the whole pack out thing. This was, this was last year, a full year and more ago. So a year and a half ago, probably. And then, uh, then this fall or after that, I was like, okay, now that he's got it done, I want to try, you know, so I'm going to do everything I need to do. I'm going to get the whole bow set up. I'm going to get dialed in and just like you do with everything else, you want to be good at it right before yeah, you yeah. you know so it there comes this new obsession of, of shooting the bow it, that's when he's going to walk out right of course and yeah. and and you the worst thing would be to take a bad shot you know and 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 watch that him run me. off with a with an arrow yeah. in him i don't want to do that, that haunts me. so there's been a tremendous amount of practice and there's been a tremendous amount of uh rucking and different things in preparation for these these elk hunts that we did this fall and last fall and elk hunting for me was like I got out there with him and I'm like, man, elk hunting is a lot like permit fishing. And it's a lot like, it's a lot like a lot of other things that I've done. But the thing that is rings true is every time I think it's going to get easier, it gets harder throughout the whole thing. Even upon completion of killing an elk, it's like, okay, we got, yeah. It's like, yeah, well, we finally did it now. Of surely it's going to be easier. And then the weight of that thing just literally crushes you. Or even if you thought, okay, well, this will be fine. It'll be a two day, you know, we'll, we'll just pack out once and then we'll pack out again. We'll take light loads. We'll take multiple things. But you're like, "Ah, I don't, if we leave it back here, you know, the bears could get it. A wolf could get it. Anything could, anything could happen. We might not find it again. I don't know. And, uh, so you're like, well, we're packing this shit out, man. We're, we're getting as much on us as possible and, you know, getting back here as early as possible. So it got like, it gets even harder. I don't know. It's just every time you think it's going to get easier, it gets harder. So I just wonder like with your elk hunting, I'm sure you're having exactly the same, same experience because I don't know anybody that, that thinks elk hunting is, is easy. And I'm sure that you're doing it in a very challenging way. So how did the, the 240 kind of help in the elk hunting? Well, I mean, I, I, I actually, it was kind of funny. So uh, backtrack to August of, of last year, I went out to Oregon in August and, and stayed with the Endicotts that own the bow rack and uh, did some training out there on the same mountain as Cam and, mm-hmm. and Wayne and all that. And I carried a rock on my shoulder and 
and stayed with them. And I did that in August. And then in September, I drove from Oregon to Utah and went with a guy named Rusty Farnsworth in Utah. And that was my elk hunt. And then I did Moab. So oh. I did all those in a row. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Um, we were unsuccessful on the, on, on the elk hunt, but even like what we did was we had an eight hour horseback ride in and to our, you know, to our camp. And then of course you're walking every day, but even, you know, a guy like me, that's all stiff from running that eight hour horseback ride. I was like, this Dude, is killing me. I, I think mean, I, I would rather walk. And all that, I think I'd rather walk. Honestly. Oh, yeah. I was like, I'm training for the Moab. Give me my bag and I'll run alongside the horse or the horse can carry my bag. Yeah. I that would be nice. You know, but yeah. I mean, it could be, you know, riding a horse, that's no different than, than running a marathon. If you're, like, not, if you're not in you're shape for it, you're not used to it. You're using all these muscles you're not used to. You don't have the technique down. It's, 100%. it can be misery, right? Yeah, like we had an eight hour ride. Yeah. It was just, and it's, you know, you're, you're going up mountains, you're going down. So you're feeling that like, I mean, down. Mean, meanwhile, like, the, the cowboy that's, that's in, 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 in the lead, he could do that for 20 days, you know, yeah, no you problem. He just ran the motor. Yeah, no know? problem. But he's used to it. He's in shape. He knows he's got great technique. Every He's got the right clothes on. He's got everything's perfect, right? Yeah. Like, you know, and then you just hop on there and think, I'm going to ride a horse for eight hours. <laughs> Good luck. Yeah, no, no, you're not. Yeah, now, it hurts. That was, that was brutal. Um, I did, um, I did a, um, what's it called? It's, um, it was, it was a group hunt. I didn't know everybody else. So it was a group hunt. It was on public land. So it was a public hang, uh, hunt. Um, I, I had a blast. It's the second time I've gone with him. Um, I chose Utah because you can get an over-the-counter tag just by calling them up or going online. I don't have to do anything special. I mean, I get my, you know, I get my archery stamp or whatever you call it, and then I get my actual hunting thing, and then the hunter safety course thing. So that's why I've done Utah because I know I'm going to get it. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was cool, but yeah, I mean, amazing experience the first year, never even heard one this, this last year, we had one on the other side of a bend roaring and I was just about to draw. And then all of a sudden it was like screaming around a corner and then it was screaming a thousand yards away. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't, I was like, that's not mine. Mine's right there. He goes, no, that's yours. He's, 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 <laughs> what happened? And when did he you smelled us and he's yeah. like, you know, piss off. I'm going the other way, but he was so far away. It was like so draining. Cause we are so fast. We had man. tracked him and called him and, you know, we were, we were playing the wind. We were going behind mountains and all of a sudden he's a thousand yards away. I'm like, what did he take one step and jump off the side of a mountain? And Rusty's like, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. It's like, Okay. Yeah, I've that had that experience. Three. I've had that experience where you're like listening to this one really close and then you're like, oh, there's a second one. It's like, no, that's the same that's one. It. It's a oh. mile away. Day four, like <laughs> I got out of the tent already kicking rocks. You would have you would have thought I already missed one. <laughs> got out day four, like, oh, you know, kind of all shucks. And then uh we we uh we saw some, but we were we were way too far. But yeah, it's just I like the prep and a lot of things. I think that's why I went to Costa Rica to catch my first Marlin. I wanted to do it on my own. I love that, that prep. Um, uh, that's why I think I respect the uh, fly fishing a lot, especially the guys that, you know, you tie your own fly, you're putting it on the rod, you head out. There's all this process. Mm-hmm. I, I, I love the process of everything. So, I mean, elk hunting, come on. I mean, if there's no, if there's anything with process, it's trying to get an elk with a bow. What about the process of running and training for, for one of these big events? Um, uh, that was, that was different here. You know, um, I didn't have a lot of places. Um, I used to do some search and rescue with my canine with, um, Peace River search and rescue. So I knew all the guys out at my state park. So that was about the only place I had some long range shooting. I've got 19 yards in the backyard and it already scares the neighbors half to death, you know? They, they, they see this camouflage bow come out of the, come out of the house and start <laughs> launching arrows at my own house, you know, so different kind of people too. So mm-hmm. they don't understand if you know what I mean. Um, but, um, the prep here was definitely overwhelming. I had that one hill, you know, I'm trying to rock, I'm packing the hiking bag. I'm wearing my full camo. Um, one thing Wayne at the bow rack told me was, start shooting in your full camo. Cause you could have 30 degree weather up there in Utah. You, you know, you're at 11,000 feet. 
So that, that helped a lot. Um, but the mind blowing thing was going from my 19 yards and even shooting somewhere else outdoors at 30 yards. Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't have everything dialed in 30 feels like a hundred, you know, everything was going everywhere. And once in a while I'd get out to the state park. So I'd shoot every morning before work. Um, I kind of had a joke going where I'd be in a full suit out there launching arrows before I, you know, I'd jump in the car. But I mean, you do it, you do that 20 days in a row. And then on a Saturday, go out there and shoot 50 and 60 yards. It's like arrows going everywhere. You know, you're yeah. breaking them, you're hitting stuff and you're like, Oh, I'm, I'm starting over again. You right. know, you're starting at 20. Then you feel like 30 is like a whole new game. You know, it's a second pin on your thing. Or if you got a single pin, it, it, I'm like, Oh, great. Okay. I got to make it more than just Saturday, you know, but I'm real fortunate with that. I mean, the guys at the bow rack, I mean, having them and, and being able to go out there in August right before season and have and Wayne and, and come on, let's face it, Wayne and Cam Haynes showing you how to prepare for elk. Yeah. That sounds it, pretty good. Cheating. Did you have, got to do it. Yeah. But did you have any trouble with um, broadhead tuning? Um, I, I did, I did, um, the first year I, I actually shot those Okay. and, um, it's just a, it's single fixed blade. Mm -hmm. Um, and that took a lot of, a lot of change. And I didn't have uh, that first year. I didn't have a, a target that would, would take a, uh, you know, a hunting blade. Um, so that was different once I got out there and they got me on the fixed blades. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I started shooting the, uh, Carney four mm. and that's a folding. Yeah. I that's don't know that one. Tip. I was shooting, um, the grim reaper, I think. Okay. Um, and I, I think that's it. It's the grim reaper. It's called the Carney four. I believe. Okay. I yeah. thought I had a box behind that me. one. That one right flies there. way better, but like, like you, I was, I was shooting at 60 and 70 here. And yeah. feeling great. And then I put on the broadhead and it's going everywhere. I mean, and then I don't have a, I don't have a, a bow shop, you know, so I'm breaking arrows and now I don't have any hunting arrows. And now I'm, now yeah. I'm getting ready for this elk hunt. And I, I just went from, I mean, I was dialed, man. I was hitting five, six arrows, you know, so tight at 60. Nice. And I was like, yeah. man. I am as dialed as I can get. And my son's like, well, you better start, you know, putting the broadheads on now. I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't know what that even means. And he's like, yeah. well, sometimes they don't fly as good, you know, as the field points. And, and I was tried the kudu head. It's just a okay. single, it looks like a stone. It's a metal blade, but it looks like a, looks like something in, you know, like Going a prehistoric. Yeah. It's only got yeah. two. It's, yeah. Almost like an air, uh, like a true Dude. arrowhead. And I'm, yeah. I'm shooting an 80 pound, uh, draw and I don't know what it was, but my bow and my setup did not like that head. And it's like phew, really? hitting everywhere. And I was just so frustrated. I got so frustrated. I'm calling my son. I'm like, what do I do? And so fine. I had one of those, those QAD heads like you got there and I yep. put that on there and it flew a lot better. And then yeah. I was like, okay, I can I can get this back in, but I only had one. And so I had to practice <laughs> one shot and then I'd go down there and get it and practice yep. again. And I'm like, okay, I'm getting more comfortable and I'm doing better with this, but it still wasn't do. I wasn't hitting like I was with the field points. So I go out there to, uh, to Bozeman and to the straight six is the archery shop that we use. And they, he was like, okay, oh, okay. yeah, I know your setup. I see what's going on. You really need to try this head and it's going to fly exactly like your field points. And I was like, there you go. I hope so. And we got them and shot and everything was a lot better. Still needed some adjustment. And my son, yeah. both my boys oh, yeah. were you with me and, and they amazing. get the Allen cool. wrench out. Yeah. And they just start yeah. tweaking things and they're like, okay, shoot three more. Boom, boom, boom. Shoot three more. Boom, boom, boom. They're like adjusting everything. And they're like, you're, you're dialed. I was like, okay. It sure, yeah. it sure was a lot better. Like so many other things, like when you got somebody that's helping you and you're not trying to, to do this, you know, all by yourself, which is totally possible and you can do it. It just takes a lot more trial and error and a lot more time and a lot more frustration. You get somebody there that like you're saying, like Cam Haynes is helping you with, with getting ready. Yeah. It's like, yeah, that could have taken you four months to do what they did 
you know, watching oh. you shoot and adjusting and I, watching you shoot. Oh no, that's the wrong broadhead. Let's try this one. And let's try this one. And I shoot again. And it's like, you're dialed. That could have taken you four months to get there. Oh yeah. And probably longer, especially with the different, the different broadheads they had at the boat rack. I mean, so I just bought, a, I bought a box of all of them and, you know, I remember seeing, yeah, I, I bought them what I did. in the cart. Let's do this. Yeah. Well, if you don't have a bow shop next to you, it's like, well, I only have three of them. And if those are the ones then I'm going to need spares. And if those aren't the ones, then I'm going to need to try these other ones. And if yeah. those are the ones I'm going to need spares, you know, like I yeah. did exactly the same thing. Well, Just, I was sitting up uh, Wayne at his farm where he actually lives. Um, he's got a great setup, obviously, uh, for shooting out there. And I was there, I was there probably 15, 20 minutes before him. And he shoots every evening. I'm out there shooting. And he walks up and he takes about four of those boxes of different ones and just puts them back in my bow rack <laughs> bag. And he's like, shoot this one and this one. And, and we're done here. And then he taught me how to, this is this last year, taught me how to do the, um, the uh, tape, the sight tape. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and as many times as you got to shoot to set up, a, I couldn't believe that how much you got to do to just put that on there. I know, you know, you got to line it up. That's why you never tent, touch anyone's bow. Like, yeah, I don't touch anybody's bow because I know what kind of work I'll went into getting my, bow. my sight tape set up and, and how, you know, confident I am or lack of confidence I have, depending on what, what month it is. Uh, and, and, you know, my sons have theirs all dialed in and, and they got their arrows and they got their whole setup and we don't touch each other's stuff. Like, yeah, this, I remember at the bow rack one day they had, they had cams bow there. And one of the guys was like, that's cams. He's coming to get it. I turned around and walked away from it. <laughs> I was like, I'm not going to be the guy that looked at his bow. I, I didn't see it. <laughs> you can look at it. Don't even look I at it. I wasn't picking it up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I'm you know, somebody, I'm like, somebody like I'm him though, man, he's got enough experience that he could quickly diagnose what's wrong and, Quickly, yeah. quickly get it back together. I mean, you could Still take the whole thing the off. No, you don't want to be the guy that does that. But um, I, I, I would think, you know, just like in fishing, you know, you somebody can pick up a rod and go, oh, you got the wrong line on it. You got the wrong, you know, this and this. Same thing, yeah. Same deal. I mean, you can but even look at it. You don't even have to cast it. It's like, you get, you know, an eleven weight line on a three weight. That's gonna not gonna, it's not gonna work. No, it's it's gonna droop around yeah. and fall off. It's gonna be terrible. Kind of, yeah. Um, <laughs> You're not getting the permit with that one. That's no, for sure. That's a, but that's what we did. So with the broadheads, when we did my my first sight tape, we shot broadheads, um, and I was able to shoot a bunch right then and kind of double double dip there. So I got I end up using that uh, Carney four. It's with the hinge blade, mm -hmm. and they say you don't need to readjust your bow. Yeah, I think that's I think I'm that. shooting the same thing. I think that's what Probably I think is. that's what I'm shooting, yeah. or it sounds I think like the it. Actual tip is called a Carney Four, and then you said it's from what company? I think it's from Grim Reaper. I'd have it to. Is. It's in the. It's a Grim, it's in the thing. I think it's called a Grim Reaper Carney Four okay. because of the four blades. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's the same. It's got a magnet. I just keep calling it's it. It's got the a Carney magnet. It, like it, it comes down. And it's got a magnet. Yeah, I think that's. Yeah. I think that's what I'm shooting. That one, that one, you know, it helped me a ton. Just and I think that there's probably it's probably just like so many other things. Like depending on your setup. Something's going to work way better for you than something else. And, oh, yeah. you know, that, that for me was, it restored my confidence and I was at an all time low. Like <laughs> I went from yeah. an all time high to an all time low back to a mediocre, you know, feeling you of go. confidence. Like yeah. if one walks out, I'm going to shoot at it before I was like, I'm not even going to take the thing. Like now has any, have you had one walk out on you yet? Have um, you yes. And, but the way that we're hunting, I can, I still continue to put my boys up front. Like I want them to, I want them yeah. to do it. And so right. one of my sons has, has killed one with a bow. My other son hasn't done it yet. So we would get ourselves in a situation to where it's like, okay, you're in the A spot. I'll be in the B spot. But you know, it's just like fishing. Like I've had so many customers that come down and they're like, okay, I'm bringing my friend and I don't want to catch one until he does. And it's like, okay, um, I can I can go with that, and that's that's cool. But the guy's never tarpon fish before, so day one he gets all the shots. He's messing it up. He's just not doing it right. Despite how much I'm trying to communicate with him, and how much his friend is trying to communicate with him, it's like, look, man, if you just get up there and just show him, 
Just you, yeah. you make the cast and you catch one. We've been fishing together for 10 years. Like you make the cast, you catch the fish. He's going to learn a lot faster. No, no, no. I really want him to do it before I do it. And it drags out for five days. It's like, come on, man. <laughs> like we're, we're trying, but it's not helping. Like the more he misses, the more the lack of confidence is just plummeting. It's plummeting down to zero confidence. We really yeah. need you to get up on the boat on the bow and you need to make a shot and show him yeah. that it's possible. And I promise you, he's going to catch one. Well, oh, yeah. a couple of times, you know, on after, after a couple of bad experiences with that, you know, I, I'm, I'm more certain now that that is the way it's like, eh, let's just, let's give him the majority of the shots, but you, you take some shots too, because yeah, he's going to get one. tired. Yeah. You know, he, he's fatigued. He's not as excited about it. Maybe he sees him too late. I don't know, whatever. But if you just break it up, Give give the other guy the shot. He's gonna happen. So, well, I I did the same thing. I didn't want to do that in elk hunting. I didn't want to say. <laughs> I didn't want to say uh, who's that visiting. That's my husky. That's uh, the one not feeling good. Okay. Well, he feels a little better now. Yeah, he's, she's doing better. Okay. Um. Uh. But I didn't want to be the one that's like, no, no, you take the shot, and then it's like, no, he walked in over here, and had anyone been sitting there, it was twelve yards away. Like, oh. so no, no, it did that didn't happen. But I'm just saying. You know, no, okay. yeah. Yeah, I'm just saying you put, I put the boys in the A spot. I'll take the B spot in just in case it doesn't happen as scripted. Right. Which it usually doesn't, but, yeah. uh, it, what's a it, script in mother nature. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's sometimes, you know, I mean, I gotta say, like I watched a lot of elk hunting videos and, and for, for four years, I'm like, I just don't see how this is going to happen. Like the video, like I watch Cameron Haynes do it. It just, they just come right in and he shoots them. <laughs> and like nothing like that has happened with us. Like we hear them, we yeah. call them, they come in, they're 200 yards away. They can't seem to come any closer, come in. You know, this one won't cross this hill. This one does this. Yeah. It's like, I just don't see how this is going to come together. Like, these these hundreds of videos I've seen, like I know Another it comes together. Is, uh, Remy Warren, yeah, no, that's he's beautiful. His own stuff, and I'm like. Forget the film. I just want to get one. And this guy's out of here like, oh, look, yeah. there's another one behind the tree. I'm going to shoot that one. It's like. Right. And and he's <laughs> he, he had to set the camera up. He's like, well, he's probably going to come in like this. And I'm probably going to set the camera up here. And this would be a good place to, to have the video. It's not like you have a moving cameraman behind you. And so I just couldn't see how it was going to happen. And then when it happened, it happened exactly like, exactly like I'd seen. You know, yeah. same thing with the fishing and the permit but fishing and everything like that. They read, they read elk like you read permit. Well, you yeah, know? I know, but uh, but tarp in school. But what I'm saying is like, y you can go out there permit fishing, and you can do everything right, and it's just not coming together. It's just not coming together for whatever reason. It's just, you, you know, and then you can go out there another day, and it's all coming together. And you can come out yeah. there, you can go out there another day, and 50% of the shots are coming together really nicely. And maybe you catch them, maybe you don't, but the shot came together perfectly, right? And eventually, we we got in front of enough elk, we, we were around enough elk, eventually it happens perfectly, yeah. just as scripted. The thing walks right in, my son smokes it at 58 yards. And, uh, nice. yeah, it was okay. really, it was really amazing. Yeah. Um, and, uh, that was, then I was like, oh, it was just like this renewed sense of confidence. Like, okay, that happened. Like I was expecting, like, you know, like I thought yeah. that it would. And like so many of these other ones, I'm like, it would be impossible to shoot that thing. Right. Like, yeah. I don't care how good you are, man. You're not shooting the behind trees like right yeah and, and, and the, the forest out there is insane right I mean, but i mean part of that is like around. lack of experience of of getting you know setting up for your shot to where you know you're going to have a good shot and the chances you know there's a there's a 40 percent ch chance it comes in here there's an 80 percent chance it comes in around here so let's get set up to where we have a shot right and let's take the extra 10 seconds it takes to move from this tree over to this place. So you have this yeah, shot right. and you can yeah. set up right. And it's just like a, like turkey hunting or whatever. But when it happened right, it was like, man, that was, that was amazing. I mean, it was just and, so cool the way it all worked out and happened. And then, and then the pack out. Yeah. <laughs> then the pack out. It's, it only gets more difficult. So what do you got going on for uh, now? You got something else on the horizon besides, is there something more than the Moab 240? 
Um, well, I was going to, um, I just signed up for the, uh, I don't, I don't know if I'm going to do it, but I signed up for the keys 100 in May. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. See. <laughs> yeah. I well, did sign up for it. So usually when I sign up, at least up, you're not out in the middle of a desert. You can stop at any convenience store anywhere along the, yeah. on the, the trail and pick up a hot dog. I, I, uh, I can't wait to collapse on the seven mile bridge or something and have yeah. to go, you know, three and a half in both ways. Well, you that's know? the, that's the one place you got to watch out for the seven mile. But tell me before we go about the, um, about this, uh, what you're going to do with your dog in, in South um, Africa. So, um, to me, like with, with hunting, I mean, you know, the saying hunters are conservationists, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, I mean, by far, look at the tags we do, look at the time we put in, look at, look how much guides care for the, for the animals. People don't realize that. Yeah, we're hunting, but what would happen if we don't have any more elk? That's it. You know, I mean, even a hiker is not going to go out there and see one. And that's mainly, I mean, it's mainly hunters. I mean, we're the ones paying six. I mean, there's guys that hunt on private land that will pay 40 grand for a tag. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there's $50,000 tags in Alaska for some of these sheep and stuff. And that's going back to conservation. So I think the big thing um, with conservation is um, I've spoke a lot in Costa Rica. I've done some crazy things where I've pulled my boat um, above um, tuna schools and not allowed giant commercial boats to take them just kind of told them to piss off. You're not getting these because they're going to take all the dolphin and the, the baby whales, whatever's with them. It's going in the meat grinder. Um, so I'm a big believer in that, but I'm going to take a tuna home, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think um, I, I love working with dogs. I, I think it's incredible to work with canines. I I've worked with bite dogs. I've gone to classes. I've done um, search and rescue before as a trainee. Um, I want to go over to Africa and help them find poachers that are trying to kill these rhinos just for a horn. Hmm. You know, uh, there's mixed stories about it. They're like, oh, they're hungry and stuff like that. It's pure money. Yeah. When you see a full body of a rhino with the horn cut off, getting eaten by other animals, that's not for food. You're, you're, you're quartering it out and you're, you're eating the animal, but they're not doing that over there. They're strictly, you know, they want a lion because they want his foot. They want a rhino because of this horn. They want an elephant because of its tusk. And um, I, that, I guess that's becoming a big thing. Um, not people going over and helping with their canines, but they're using canines to track. Uh, they're finding camps. So they're doing article searches. Uh, they're finding poachers. And then they're actually even helping find the animals um, to tag them so they can track them. And I think so it's I, I love conservation. I, I love having animals on the planet and I love working with dogs. I don't see something cooler on the planet to be able to go, even if it's, you know, I'm not military or anything, so I'm probably not going to realistically go look for poachers. But um, I think to be able to find a camp or um, find an animal that the vets can tag, I, I think that would be incredible. So who do you work with are there are there organizations that you can there, there's hook a lot of with? organizations i've had a few reach out on instagram just because i keep posting this and i you know i started following them and talking to them there's one um, called uh the, the canine i'm gonna look it up right now i got it right here um there's a couple of them one of them's called canine ranger project um there's another one that just reached out to me called uh Wildlife In Initiative Trust Africa. Um, they work hand in hand with each other. They've, they've reached out when I started following them and talking to them. Now, I don't know if I'm going to be working with them, but there are two big ones that are doing that with a couple um, uh, big organizations over there with vets. It's, it's very new to me, so I can't talk a lot about it because I just don't know. Right. But I know they're looking for volunteers to go over and do that. And, uh, yeah, I just, How long would you expect to stay over there doing that? I'm guessing with a volunteer thing, I bet you it's maybe quarterly or maybe half the year, you know? Mm -hmm. So if I could do quarterly, I would love to do quarterly, you know, because I still have a business and I have the rest of my life over here and see where it went. Right. Um, maybe this year, if I got to go, if I got to go over and just experience it, you know, for a week or two to just see what it takes. I'm, I'm so new at it. But it was kind of like Moab. I mean, you know, by 2020, I had to burn up my butt to do it in 2021. So if it happens, great. I'm going to train all year for it because I need to be physically fit. The dog needs to be ready. 
and it, I already have a blast doing the tracking. I've, I've got friends out there that'll go hide in the bushes and I run them down and I've got hunting buddies at uh, bird season right now. They'll go out there and um, I'll come a couple hours later, like they're into their hunt that day and I'll go to their car and my dog will sniff something out of the back of the truck and then we'll go run them down. Mm. So I'm like, you know, I can find all your hunting spots now, you know, wow. <laughs> but um, I just, I, it's just something that's really interesting to me. So right now it's just research, but if I get a call that I get to do it, it's kind of like anything else. You need to be ready at all times. Kind of like Cass was saying, you know, mm -hmm. so we're playing it now. Like we're going right. That's the only way I can look at it. Cause if I got called and I wasn't ready, I'd feel like an idiot. It's like the hunting, you know, you hit that elk in the back hip because, Oh yeah, I didn't feel like training, but I knew I was going on a hunt as, as, a, as you, as a hunter and a fisherman and conservation, you'd, you'd feel pretty stupid, mm -hmm. you know? So yeah. I would, I would want to be ready and, you know, definitely something like that. The people around me, you know, they'd want me to be ready. Um, right so we're going to train like we're going and it's going to seem like I'm going. And if I don't, I'm, I'm okay with it, you know, but if I got to go, boom, wow. <laughs> nice. You know, it'd be an amazing experience. And that's all this, that's all my dog wants to do. I mean, he, we search in the house. See if he, he's sitting there watching TV with me. If he walks off, I'll, I'll take a, I'll take a cup that I touched and hide it behind the couch. And he goes and finds the cup. I mean, that's all he wants to do. So it's hmm. like, it's let's go. Let's that's go. cool, man. So, yeah. That's cool. So, well, I hope that works out for you. We'll, uh, yeah, we'll see. It's, it's, that's why I say on all the posts at the very end, it's kind of a pipe dream, but it, it's something to work towards. I love having goals. So if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, then, you know, I'll, I'll do something else with, uh, conservation. I, I always will. So whether it's with the elk out West or something like that, but yeah. That's, gotcha. That's the goal right now. That and this 100 and the keys that I don't want to do, but <laughs> hey. I've already signed on the dotted line. Yeah. So if you're signed up, you're yeah. signed up. Yeah. That's it. All right. Well, uh, we'll, we'll catch up again after the 100 and the keys or, or if yeah. you go down to Africa, uh, I'd love to have you back. Um, oh yeah, definitely. I'd love to be back. I, I actually, you know, I, I knew who you were before and I was following your regular Instagram. And then I went to your podcast one and I saw that and it was like, fitness and, and fishing, you know, I was like, <laughs> yeah. What about let's... this? Do I not like, like, I don't yeah, know. <laughs> yeah. This is, this is there, you know, that's so right was, on, I man. Was, I was looking forward to it. All right. All right. Well, cool, man. Well, it's great to talk to you, get to know you a little bit and uh, good luck with everything you got going on. Thanks for being on the, uh, on the podcast and man, seriously, congratulations on the two forty. That's thank you. That's serious thank business you. right there, man. Yeah. Really yeah, good. good deal, so. Really good. All right. Well, Jason, thanks man. And, uh, I if, really uh, Oh, tell how, tell people how they can follow your Instagram or, or whatever connect with you. Yeah, I got, well, I got an Instagram, so it's Jason L. Coffrin. And then I got the new one that I'm going to start doing, um, tarp and charters just in the summer, May and June here. I want to get that started. So that's Mr. Trigger sport fishing and that's Mr. Trigger sport and the same plug on, on IG. And I'm just getting started with that. And, and getting back in the fishing game too okay all right man yeah. well good luck all right jason all right. thanks man take care see you thanks so much for having me you bet